You might be asking yourself, what exactly is carbon negative, and why have I been hearing so much about it? Well, I'm glad you asked. But to really explain it properly, we will need to briefly touch on a term you already probably quite familiar with. The carbon footprint. The carbon footprint concept is related to and grew out of the older idea called the ecological footprint, a concept invented in the early 1990s by Canadian ecologist William Rees and the Swiss-born regional planner Mathis Wackernagel at the University of British Columbia. The carbon footprint can be defined as the total amount of carbon caused or produced by an organization, event, product, or person. So getting down to the nitty-gritty, what this basically means is that just about everything, from production of a product, the shipping and packaging of a product, and even the use of the product itself can, and generally does, create carbon emissions. And seeing as carbon is the primary culprit in the creation of greenhouse gases, which leads to global climate change, uh, well, it feels a bit intense and unescapable. And I know this all seems a little depressing, but don't worry. This wouldn't be much of a presentation if I didn't offer a solution. The carbon sink. What is a carbon sink? Well, it's rather simple, really. The official definition of a carbon sink is, and I quote, <clears throat> A natural or artificial reservoir that accumulates and stores carbon-containing chemical compounds in the independent period in the process known as carbon sequestration. Did you get all that? Well, it basically means that a carbon sink is anything that absorbs carbon and holds on to it. Things like algae, seaweed... Really anything that carries out photosynthesis. The largest example of which being trees. Trees are pretty amazing. You can't tell just by looking at them, but they actually breathe, just like you and me. Unlike you and me, however, they breathe in carbon and breathe out oxygen. This tends to work out quite well for us humans. During this process, the carbon is sequestered, or stored, inside the tree, and presto! Carbon is taken out of the environment, converted into nice, breathable oxygen, and the remainder stored within the tree itself. Problem solved, right? Well, there is this one little hiccup. Deforestation. Here's an image showing the rate of deforestation of virgin forests just within the United States. Now couple that with ever-increasing levels of carbon emissions and less and less trees to absorb it all, well you begin to see the picture. Now you're probably thinking, he promised me a solution. That doesn't sound like a solution. That sounds like the apocalypse. <laughs> well, don't fret. No more doom and gloom from me. Now that you know a little history, it's time to explain carbon negative and why it's so important. Simply put, carbon negative is anything that sinks and sequesters more carbon than it generates, either naturally or or through its carbon footprint generated during its production, packaging, and shipping. The perfect example of a carbon-negative product is this. This is the Corcus Suber, more commonly called the cork oak tree. Once the cork oak tree is about 25 years old, its bark is traditionally stripped from the trunks every nine years, much like the shearing of a sheep. <laughs> This is a huge benefit due to the fact that the cork tree is not cut down to obtain the cork. The tree continues to live and grow and act as a carbon sink for roughly 200 years. Each nine-year period in between shearings, a shipping container worth of cork from the cork oak tree sequesters roughly 48 tons of carbon, which we will represent here as this little piggy bank. And there we go. Now we're going to track the total amount of carbon generated through each step of the cork's production. I'll use these little arrows here to show how much carbon is being generated with each step. And at the end, we'll compare the amount of carbon generated from the amount of carbon sequestered by the cork oak tree. Sound good? Alright, let's do it. The very first step of production is harvesting cork oak bark. Since this process is traditionally done by hand, the only carbon generated would be transporting the cork to the next stage of production. And we'll count that as 0.25 ton. The next step is manufacturing. This is generally where the majority of products today generate very large amounts of carbon and release it into the atmosphere, as seen here. However, cork manufacturers make use of an extremely efficient boiler that utilizes small bits of cork bark that separate from the hole in order to power the entire manufacturing process thus giving them roughly 93% efficiency. 
If you ever get a chance to check out one of these boilers, I highly recommend it. They're very cool. Let's mark that down as another 0.25 tons generated. The next step is loading all the newly manufactured construction grade cork into trucks and transporting it to the port. We'll jot that down as another 0.25 tons. The next step is shipping. As large ships are the most efficient method of delivering the most amounts of goods at once, this makes the most sense for transporting the cork internationally. A vast majority of the world's cork comes from southwestern Europe, primarily Portugal. We'll count that as 4 tons of carbon generated. Once all the cork makes its trip across the ocean, let's just say in this instance it was shipped to the United States, it gets loaded up on trucks and transported to whomever ordered it. Since the United States is much larger than Portugal, it's safe to assume that the driving time will be increased, thus generating more carbon. I'm going to take this into account and tally post-ocean transport as 2.5 tons of carbon. The next stop on the cork's journey will be the warehouse of whoever ordered the cork. To move and organize the cork around the warehouse, to power the lights, operate any forklifts, or packaging for further shipping all generates a carbon footprint. Not too terribly high of one, however. About 0.25 tons. After the cork has been sold to a contractor or builder, it's back on the road again, this time with a direct route, minimizing the travel distance and time, thus reducing the carbon emission. Let's mark it down as 0.25 tons. The last stop on our cork's journey is at the job site, once it's been received by the builder or contractor. During the construction, some tools used generate carbon emissions, as well as carbon generated from transporting the builders to the job site. Let's add that final number here. So there we have it, the complete production cycle of natural cork. Now you might be asking, why is cork being used in construction? I thought cork was just used to plug up wine bottles. Well, that might be true, but cork has actually been used in construction in the United States since the late 1800s and early 1900s, as seen here in this Armstrong Cork Company advertisement from 1920. Another eco-friendly advantage of cork is that it is a super insulator, keeping heat in when it's cold outside and keeping cold in when it's hot outside, far surpassing any non-natural carbon-producing insulation, allowing for an extremely more efficient use of energy for a house or building thus lowering an air conditioning or power bill, which is good for your wallet, and even further lowering the amount of carbon being generated, which is good for the planet. Now let's go check back in on our little piggy bank. Let's see, we have 48 tons of carbon sequestered here. Now take away the 8 tons of carbon generated by the entire production process, and we have a total of 40 tons of carbon that was absorbed and stored by our friend, the cork oak tree. Do you see why carbon negative is so important now? Just imagine if everything we made, bought, sold, was carbon negative. I hope this video has been educational for you and will help you decide on carbon negative products in the future. I will leave you on this note. If each container of natural cork is responsible for sequestering 40 tons of carbon, and each container has enough cork in it to insulate, let's say, five houses. That means that each house that is built using cork is responsible for sequestering eight tons of carbon, not including the future energy savings due to its insulation. Now think about this. The average American car produces roughly eight tons of carbon every two and a half years. Just by simply building a house using a carbon negative product like cork, can offset the carbon emissions from your car. Now that will definitely shrink your carbon footprint.